I will first speak to you briefly about Coutinho's love encounters. And uh, afterwards, to conclude, say just a few words about Coutinho's attitude when roles were changed and his own personal voice began to be heard a great deal, as in Carlos Nader's film we just saw. Uh, at the end of a very well-known documentary by Krzysztof Kieslowski, a woman born in 1880, a hundred years old at the time, says she wants to live more, much more. Eduardo Coutinho also wanted to continue living. With different words, he said so many times. When he was 80 years old, he was very brief and said, unfortunately, we die. If I die, I hope it won't be any time soon, he declared. But his wish was not granted. To me, it still seems rather early to speak of Cochin and of his films without remembering the tragic circumstances of his death. Perhaps it's a way to deal with the blow and to keep his memory alive. We all feel the need to find a rational explanation for the irrational. We define the cause and believe we have cast light on the incomprehensible horror. However, for unbelievers, unbelievers and agnostics, the former lacking religion and the latter well aware of their own ignorance, both dissatisfied with diagnosis and labels, all that is really left is to deal with their own perplexity. As Chekhov wrote to a friend, nothing is clear in this world. Only fools and charlatans know and understand everything. Thinking of what to say to you this afternoon, I ask myself if there is still anything new to be said about Eduardo Cochin and about his work. The question may appear rhetorical, but actually few Brazilian filmmakers have had in their lifetimes the critical acclaim granted to him. And in their mature years, even fewer were as prolific as he was, having made himself heard through eight films produced in 12 years and a ninth film only shown privately. Besides the numerous documentaries he directed, as his prestige increased, he began to grant so many interviews that, in the end, his declarations became kind of repetitive. In, in view of such a tremendous exegesis and the sheer number of these declarations, there is no doubt that any posthumous commentary on Coutinho's films runs the serious risk of drowning in redundancy. What I propose to comment here, first of all, are some of the guidelines of Coutinho's method. Although I am sure he would at least smile, or maybe even laugh, and probably curse, certainly curse, to hear me speak of his method. The major innovation in seven of the nine documentaries that Coutinho directed after Santo Fort, shot in 1999, when he was 66 years old, is the fact that they show a series of encounters and brief conversations which usually lacked any precise pre-established goal, taking place in ever more demarcated spaces, either a favela, or a building or a township, one in the outskirts of Sao Paulo, another in the hinterlands of Paraíba, 
or a stage, or even a room. As the years went by, Coutinho's health began to decline, and his physical strength weakened. Thereafter, nearby locations within a circumscribed space, in addition to being an aesthetic option, became a necessary condition for him to con continue making films, especially after uh, O Fim e o Principio, the end and the beginning, shot in the northeast of Brazil in 2004. It is true that there are encounters and conversations in Coutinho's former films, before Santo Forte. The main difference, however, is that the documentaries after Santo Forte cease to deal with Coutinho's own direct personal experience, as was the case in his 1984 film Cabra Marcado para Morrer. In 1967, the young Coutinho, before Cabra Marcado para Morrer, declared to Cine Cubano magazine that he hoped that uh, this is a quote that he quote hoped that the new generation would be able to establish a certain relation between their work and their life unquote 30 years later Coutinho's documentaries no longer contained any direct relationship between life and work the historical event was substituted by the everyday, the martyr, the martyr by ordinary people. Speech, gesture, and gaze became the focus of his observation. The interest is in that which exists due to the simple fact that it ex exists. This explains Coutinho's affinity with Spinoza, via Bourdieu, accept the world, agree with the world, with the natural facts, and also with Chekhov, accept things as they are, avoid judging, merely observe. I would like to examine now for a moment Coutinho's protocol, followed both when his films were in pre-production and when they were being shot. Resembling actual love encounters, filming was preceded by a careful selection process and obeyed precise rules, both regarding the way they were filmed and the dynamics of the, co of the conversations during which Coutinho listened more than he spoke. He asked short questions and gazed straight into the eyes of the men and women he talked to. Therefore, the physical nearness and the deep gaze were as important as the listening. For Coutinho, relationships established in the encounters were erotic in the wider sense of the world as he felt the need to clarify when speaking to Carlos Nader. In his own words, it was these physical relationships that led an old lady or a young hooker with her knee touching his to confide in him. According to Coutinho, quote, the body speaks and the spoken word is linked to the body. When it comes from the gut, that is thanks to an erotic relationship he says in Nader's film. Confronted by another young director in a film that has not been released yet, with uh, Walter Benjamin's aphorism that he himself, Coutinho himself, had quoted 14 years earlier, uh, Coutinho replied in a certain way. The aphorism is, quote, the more the listener can forget himself, the deeper whatever he hears is registered in his memory, wrote Benjamin. And Coutinho replied to the young director that confronted him with this aphorism. In short, 
what I would like to be, what I would like to do in films is, is expressed in this quotation. This after having said moments before that he m was madly in love with Benjamin's messianism and melancholy. The, f the film shooting precepts included a static camera and the non-existence of obstacles between Coutinho and those he addressed, who should be, as he stated, at a fair distance, he says that in Nader's film, which meant quite close. Although he remained most of the time out of the frame, his presence and interaction were crucial. In order to choose the men and women who would take part in these love encounters, the Cupid, or the assistant in another word, would conduct a record, would conduct and record a previous conversation without Coutinho's presence. When choosing his partners, he would generate a great deal of expectation with regard to the result of the encounter, to the point of having occasional outbursts of fury when he was felt let down. During breaks, alone with the crew, his innate pessimism might rise its head and he would lash out strongly against those he believed had not proved during the conversation capable of rising to the proposal of establishing a relationship with him by means, again, of physical proximity, eye contact, and listening, essential components of the success of the encounter. Coutinho avoided making moral judgments of his partners. He was all eyes and ears during the encounters. He sought to establish a harmonious relationship with the person he was talking to, but without ceasing to question the meaning of the words they pronounce, pronounced, as well as their attitudes. He tried to establish an intense relationship seeking pleasure and creating passion. Coutinho was well aware, however, that it would be a fleeting love, since it would be, would be limited to that hour or so of the encounter, after which he lost all interest in his passing partners deliberately avoiding new meetings after having filmed them. Filmed them. As he says in Nader's film, he considered people themselves to be a fraud compared to his marvelous characters. When you go back and spend a few days together, it's routine, he says in the film, and routine is unbearable. Unlike the historian, collective memories and strictly Faithful, faithful reports held, held no interest to Coutinho, for Coutinho. He centered his attention on the different forms of self-representation that surfaced in the encounters. What inspired his enthusiasm were eyewitness reports and individual memories, subjective and by their very nature impossible to reproduce. For him, they had value simply due to having been told, as he declared, again to Carlos Nader. At a certain instant, when a mutual friction, a desire to re review oneself, one's fear to reach one another, took place. These encounters and conversations, therefore, were radically anti-romantic. The prerequisite of the relationship Coutinho sought to establish was brevity. Just as for the poet of the Tableau Parisien in the famous sonnet commented by Benjamin, for Coutinho, quote, the moment of enchantment coexists with a final farewell, unquote. The only exception being Elisabeth Teixeira of Cabra Marcado para Morrer with whom he remained in touch sporadically during five decades, after 
they met, first met in 1962. The brief love encounters and the time spent with his crew served as antidotes for Coutinho's loneliness. Filming was vital, a vital need for him. Again, to Nader, he says, it's what keeps me alive. If I don't film, I die. It is a way of staying alive. Nothing else matters in the least. The film shoots may have been the happiest time in the last decade of his life. Even so, to avoid, avoid being swayed by sentiment, sentimentality, Coutinho insisted on saying he was still as unhappy as ever. Before I finish, I would just like to briefly mention Coutinho's attitude when roles changed and he stopped being the one who observed. During the numerous occasions when in, the, in his last years he switched places and sat in front of the camera or merely the microphone, Coutinho seemed to be trying to make up for his relative muteness when he was the, was the director. As we saw in Mother's film, he would arrive in a lousy mood, begin ungraciously, reject the first question, at times aggressively, and then, little by little, he would join the fray and talk nonstop, at times incomprehensibly, mumbling madly, running words, running words together and skipping completely the lead. At other times, he resorted to impolite language, to say the least. He adored swear words and used them as he pleased. He would confuse names and dates while at the same time revealing a great deal not yet mentioned in former interviews. On the eve of his last Thursday, for example, he spoke with uncommon intensity about his own fear, about the use of the dead and the martyrs by both the left and the right, about his time in prison in Recife, of which in more than 40 years of friendship he had never mentioned to me, for example. His time in prison which haunted his dreams, he said, for many years about the regime of terror installed in Paraíba and Pernambuco after the 1964 coup, about the murder of one of Elizabeth Teixeira's sons, killed by his own brother bef before his mother's eyes. Months earlier, he foresaw the future when he declared something that he mentions in passing in others' films, but. In this other interview, he says it more precisely. He declared that his ideal was to die in the middle of a film. He said he dreamt of making unfinished films. Due to legal issues, Cochin was unable to film one of his last projects. This time, the encounters would be with children, a clear clue to identify the origin of his inspiration in the fascination children held for Benjamin. Cochino left one last film, shot, and at the time of his death, not yet edited, that we will be able to see this year. The final record of his gaze, his voice, his listening, and his body. These are precious rem remains that survive together with his former films, his statements, and our memories. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so again, uh I'd like to thank Princeton, Pedro, Bruno, all of you, and, and also Carlos for his film, which I have seen many times. And again and again, I'm always astounded how beautiful Coutinho is. Uh, 
as a as a man and 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 also his ideas so thanks uh, Eduardo Coutinho truly admired Walter Benjamin as we saw like Benjamin he doubted all forms of redeeming optimism he distrusted progress and was not attracted to winners rather prizing defeat to the point of cultivating it in his own life writing for the New Yorker critic Alex Ross said of Benjamin that he ended up preferring inconspicuous forms over the pretentious universal gesture of the book something similar can be said of Coutinho he ended up preferring documentary film over fiction it is a genre of lesser symbolic currency Coutinho claimed that a documentarian was to a fiction director what a dentist was to a physician. So not only did he opt not to become a doctor, but with the exception of his early masterpiece Cabra Marcado para Morrer, the type of documentary he became known for systematically avoids both grand themes and what he called the great characters of history, os grandes homens da história. Instead, he preferred men and women on whose fate Benjamin's powerless angel of history takes pity. Like Benjamin, Coutinho also loved quotes. It is easy to understand why, coming from a man who spent his life hearing what his characters had to say to him. Indeed, he had a plan to do a film using only quotes. So in memory of Coutinho's love for other people's speech, let me propose to you one or two quotes that may help us shed light on the cinema invented by the friend we are honoring here today. Writing is a way of remembering what we've lived or a way of remembering something that we could have lived. To write well, the difference between one form and the other has to disappear. This is by our colleague Pedro Mira Monteiro, and it helps us reflect on Coutinho's work. If there is a common denominator in all his films, it is memory. Coutinho viewed memory as life plus invention. For him, the factual experience was never as alive as the memory of that experience. He not only expected, but he actually hoped that his characters would add some imaginary material to the lived experience, somewhat like time leaves sediments on a building, transforming it. Imagination is a form of truth, as another friend wrote. To draw on Pedro's formulation, Coutinho's filmmaking relies not only on the time elapsed between the fact and the memory of the fact, but also on the narrator's unawareness of the discrepancies between these two moments. We can even say that the longer the time elapsed and the greater the unawareness, the more Coutinho is in his element. So let me give you an example in radical opposition to this ideal scenario. I will show you a passage from the first scene of Coutinho's last film, a film that he never had time to finish because he died just a few months after leaving the studio. The film was edited by Jordana Bergi and by me. For the first time, Coutinho decided to talk with young people, around 18 to 20 years of age. So here was a problem. For these people, this lapse of time that Pedro mentions does not exist yet, because time has not had time to pass. On the fourth day of shooting, convinced that the project was doomed to fail, he voiced his misgivings to Jordana. Importantly, this scene is only in the film because Coutinho is no longer here. It would have no place in the film he would have made. As other people feel that I'm curious. Do you think I'm curious? The question is that I'm asking really to ask. It can be that. I feel that. I feel that. Se esse homem está curioso, para que fala? Para quem? 
Então tá aí a resposta, né? Não, é isso? Só posso dar os olhos, né? O corpo, o corpo de longe. Né? Mas você tá dando? Não sei. Ter fé é difícil, viu? Recuperar a fé é muito difícil. The faith he talks about here, and that he thought he had lost, refers to the capacity to connect with the world, or in his terms, communion with the other. How did this communion manifest itself in his films? Here's an example. A senhora casou? Uma vez. Uma vez. Como é que foi o casamento? Faz 45 anos que eu sou viúva. Como é que foi o casamento? O casamento muito ruim. Muito? O casamento foi ruim. Por quê? Porque ele era um cachaceiro e judiava com eu. E durou quanto tempo o casamento? Aí, aí deu 17 anos. Judiava? Judiava muito. Aí ele bebeu uma cachaça e foi. Passou na lavagem que mataram ele. E quantos filhos a senhora teve com ele? Hein? Quantos filhos? Quatorze. Senhora... Quantos vingaram? Hein? Quantos criaram? Dois. E, e foi felicidade não ter se criado. Por quê? Um, eu estou bem. Um que eu tenho, que eu criei, está em Porto Velho e Rondônia, Amazonas, nesse mundo. Só vejo ele de cinco em cinco anos. Ele lembra da senhora? Se lembra. Escreve? Telefona. Telefona? É. A senhora sente falta dele? Saudade muito. É muito longe, né? É, mas tá bom. E o outro filho? A outra mora ali. Aquela casa ali. Hum. Nós quando nasce, Jesus escreve nossos dias de nós viver. E a hora de nós morrer. Desde que nasce? Sim, senhor. Então, a senhora não se preocupa com a morte, preocupa? Pensa eu tenho nisso. muito medo. O senhor não tem, não? Claro que tem. Ah, Maria. <risos> não é o jeito. Né? Hum? <risos> Nós não temos o que fazer, né, meu filho? Quando chegar a hora. Adeus. É como essa luz, nós é tudo alegre, botando isso e aquilo para. Fiquei no escuro. Tem Aí que... acende esse lampião, não clareia, não. Por quê? Por que não clareia, não? Uma luzinha que. Ah, Maria, não presta, não. Aí quando chega é uma alegria. This conversation is anything but a journalistic interview much less a cross-examination or an inquiry into the truth of the facts, as in the films by Errol Morris, for instance. I don't find it easy to know what the nature of this exchange is, but I know what it is not. <coughs> Cochinho's word is not the word of the prosecutor or of the defense attorney, much less that of the judge. It's not the word of the reporter nor of the activist or even of the social scientists seeking to understand the structures behind the phenomena. One could think that it's the word of the psychoanalyst, but it isn't, because it does not seek to reveal hidden truths. Indeed, Cochino disliked the notion of depth, as we saw, as much as he abhorred the concepts of purity and perfection, always preferring what lay on the surface, mixed and impure. All in all, Cochinho's word is not a useful one, in the sense of a tool to achieve some objective beyond the encounter. It is contingent 
and rather quite useless. It does not produce and rather it refuses to produce summaries, generalization systems, theses, and it doesn't try to prove anything. It does not dig for evidence, which is why his filmmaking steadily abandons illustrative inserts that aim to prove the veracity of what is being said. He will not show a photograph of Mariquinha's son in order to substantiate her story. He does not doubt her, and the editing reflects this moral choice. Escorel might be right, one does not challenge the word of a lover, and at least at the beginning of a affair. I can only give my body, my eyes, Coutinho says in Carlos' film. Look at Dona Mariquinha's eyes, always looking away from the lens. She's not interacting with the camera, with an impersonal and thus bodiless interrogator at the service of an objective investigation. Mariquinha's relationship is with Eduardo Coutinho, with his tone of voice, his gestures, his proximity, his body, his eyes. When the alchemy in this type of interaction is total, here is the result. Pessoal de Terassas gosta da senhora? Deu pouca gente. Não gosta? É, porque eu também sou nojenta. O que quer dizer nojenta? Eu não gosto de adular. Nojenta é quem adula, é isso? É, gente adulador que é chaleira. Eu não gosto de adular ninguém. Gosto de quem gostar. Agora eu só não gosto de brigar. Dona Mariquinha, Oi. a senhora sabe que a gente veio se despedir, né? Oi. Porque domingo é o último dia, é. na Casa da Rosa, então hoje é praticamente o último dia. É no último dia. Tá bom? Tá bom. Eu espero que a senhora tenha boa sorte daqui a um ano, se a gente voltar. Hum. Espero encontrar a senhora viva e forte para mostrar o um filme, tá bom? Tá bom. Não é isso mesmo. Deus queira que nós ainda se veja. Isso. Não é não? The symbolic proximity becomes physical. The film joined us together. I gave you something, you gave me something. That's the meaning of the erotic as he says beautifully in Nader's film. So now a second quote and a last quote. Empathy, she writes, means realizing no trauma has discrete edges. Trauma bleeds <clears throat> out of wounds and across boundaries. Sadness becomes seizure. Empathy demands another kind of porousness in response. She means porousness in the witness a willingness to let a stranger's troubles seep in and slowly unfurl their meaning. I believe this idea of porousness unfurls the secret of Coutinho's cinema. I see porousness as a quality that lets things not only seep in, but, but also seep out. It goes in both directions, and this seems to me of crucial importance. Here I have a slightly different take from Escorel. For me, these conversations do not refer only to the character. Coutinho is intimately involved in them. His anxieties, his problems, what made him happy and what tormented him are as present in these conversations as the joys, pains and fears of his subjects. In the hinterlands of Paraíba, where he went to film O Finho Principio, he fell ill and nearly died. It's not a coincidence that he was therefore drawn to old people's metaphysics of the other world, a theme which permeates the whole documentary. On the set of his last film, Cochin was frail, sick, and on the brink of despair. After that fourth day on which he spoke of his crisis, he moved on and finished the shooting. Here is one of the conversations that are now part of the film. Você não acha que a vida? A vida? A 
a vida, a vida humana, a vida nossa, é uma coisa muito estranha, muito esquisita. Um amigo meu me disse, você acha que a vida é só comer, deitar e viver? Não, não. A vida é mais complexa do que você pode pensar, do que você pode imaginar. Eu acho que o pior medo é de ficar sozinho. Sozinho você fala fisicamente isso. Fisicamente. Por exemplo, para que existe família um pouco? Para não viver sozinho, né? Uhum. Para que tem família? Para quê? Você não precisa ter família, né? Então, vai ser bom você casar e conseguir ficar com uma mulher há muitos anos, né? Esse foi o meu maior sonho, de ficar com uma pessoa, ficar com ela para sempre. Mesmo tendo nossos problemas, mesmo que tenha, sei lá, um problema tão grande que a gente pensa em se separar, a gente continuasse junto e eu conseguisse arrumar isso. Porque o amor é isso, guerras, conflitos, felicidades. Por isso que a palavra amor não é só uma coisa, é complexa. Eu sou da época do ultra-romantismo, vamos dizer assim. Pode ser, mas sabe que viver é sofrer também, né? Uhum, Alegria mas só que é sofrer, que tá... é inevitável. É aquela história, ou amor ou morte. Não estou dizendo que vou me matar, calma. Estou é. dizendo o seguinte, ou você ama ou a vida não faz sentido. Não, você ama e morre. Não tem ou, não quer ou, é ama e morre. É, também. Isso que é a vida, a vida não é nunca amor ou morte, é ama e morre. É vida e morte, não é vida ou morte. Uhum. Não existem duas coisas separadas assim. Quando você entende o que é a vida, você não quer mais viver. Por isso que o morto é sábio. É. Mas não bom. É. Vamos... Alguém já voltou da morte? Quer dizer, sem ser o conto da. É... Sem ser o conto da Bíblia. Você conhece alguém que voltou da morte? Então, como você vai saber o que é a morte? A morte é algo belo e medonho. Por quê? A morte ela significa, é, em algumas religiões, que você vai para o céu, você vai ir para várias outras coisas. Mas é medonho porque você não sabe se é verdade. Isso é estranho. Foi? O silêncio ficou estranho, esse silêncio. O silêncio tem que ficar estranho. Por quê? O silêncio é mais estranho que a vida, porque é isso. Tá falando, falando, não tá falando, não tá falando, é só a televisão que fica ligada o tempo todo. Eu é pedir que em silêncio. É só aí que você pensa. O silêncio é ótimo. É. Você não é obrigado a falar, não sou obrigado a te perguntar, né? Mas é. Entrevista, não é isso? É isso aí. Não é isso? Uhum. A gente não... É. Pode ser silêncio. Uhum. Silêncio. Você pode dar para alguém, para ela. Uhum. E nós, rapaz. Lá, o rapaz que está aqui. Cadê o outro? Tem alguém tem? Rapaz lá. Uhum. Mas também pode olhar para o céu, fechar os olhos. Não é não? Uhum. Vou te envergonhar, te faz mal. Tá em vergonha, porque... <risos> Ninguém, Por ninguém é apto ao silêncio. Por, vamos, vamos ver assim. Quando você está. Quando você mora perto de uma floresta, você ouve o som dos pássaros. Quando você está perto de uma praia, você ouve o som da, da, é, do riacho. As pessoas que é, vão para o espaço têm que colocar fone de ouvido. Porque o silêncio é tão estranho para o ser humano que pode. Eu acho que pode provocar insanidade. Se for eterno, é. Uhum. Mas tudo que for eterno provoca insanidade. Até uma certa parte da vida. Porque tudo que for eterno provoca insanidade. Mas depois da insanidade, como dizem, depois do caos, vem paraíso. É possível. Uhum. É por isso que não dá para rejeitar nada. Que? Como assim? É não que... dá para rejeitar nada, nem é. aceitar inteiramente tudo. É um mistério, não é não? Uhum. I like to think that he had recovered faith, if not in life, at least in his filmmaking. Thank you.
we always uh, been touched for the phrases and the dialogues uh, that have been before. So uh, it's with this emotion that I begin to talk and thank you again to Princeton, Pedro, Bruno, uh, and all the people that work hard uh, to be this moment possible. And the question raised by Pedro and Bruno uh, opened a fruitful space, highlighting the importance of interview, like uh, Eduardo, João, né, said now. And they uh, stressing listening as a fundamental factor, but also alluding the connections with other areas of knowledge. They helped me to arrive at one of the main themes of my intervention, the influence of the cinema on the psychoanalysis. First, the impressions of the, the film. 7 of October, 7 de outubro, it's a very beautiful interview in which Carlos, the director, pays homage to the filmmaker turned character interviewee. In that reverse of holes at Carlos Neda states in the film from the very first scenes. Besides the use of the same crew, the director's styles here produce the effects that Coutinho's films are used to cause in the audience. As Carlos states near the end of the interview, we leave the movie theater after watching his films, enjoying life fully. The film first images come from the beginning of Edificio Master, with the narrator unveiling of what the director wants, to, wants and will do, without presupposing that the outcome can be determined. To continue, the unexpected and the fiction are essential. The very beginning of the interview, like we saw, getting on set, statements, I feel terrible, I need to smoke, otherwise I will live, pretending not to see the ashtray left for reuse. Knowing the proposal of the film, he concludes, do I have to talk? Then I'm screwed. Conclusion, coaching likes to make people talk, to find the ideal distance, enable to something of truth to arise. The truth within that dialogue of that evanescent moment show us that there is no totality. Something happens and is lost in an interview, which is not recovered to the final cut. To a certain extent, that is why is left for the director, something singular and non-transferable. A second moment at the beginning of 7 of October highlights another key theme to me. The specificity of the moment. The presence of the footage, I quote, is the only thing which interests me. Maybe it's a chance to express coherence with the truth of the filming. This reminds me of another interview done in the program Sangue Latino, Blood, Latin Blood, conducted by Eric Nepomuceno, in which Coutinho refers to a lecture given by Jacques Lacan in Louvain, discussing the relationship between man and death. Lacan stated that death was within the domain of faith. However, it acquired such strength that the certainty there is an end is what makes life endurable. Curiously, this theme returns in the first scene of Edificio Master, like we see that Coutinho randomly selects, do you remember the dialogue, choose a number, <laughs> when the call girl states that I like life, but I expect my death at any moment. I will stop suffering, when I die, I will be happy. These scenes, interspersed with questions, raise deep considerations about life and art, the film and the masterwork, family, sonship, heritage. And these considerations entail a connection between psychoanalysis and cinematographic discourse. And I would like to situate our current position 
in relation to three points. One, not to do apply psychoanalysis and nor psychologizing culture. This was popular among early psychoanalysts and thus by the possibilities of extending their theories to the most diverse fields. Today, we no longer feel compelled to do a, psycho, a psychobiography of an author, nor a psychoanalysis of the character. Using a film or a book to illustrate our practice is part of our history. While it is indeed interesting, it is only a first step and to move forward requires further steps. Today, we recognize that life is too complex to be accounted for by a single form of knowledge, like the boy says in the film. Given this complexity, we must recognize the importance of inutility, of loss, as fundamental to giving new meaning to what we have come to consider the practice of an psychoanalyst. As it appears in the film, I have a fascination with everything which is unfinished, imperfect, residue, debris. Perfection does not exist. Life is about giving meaning to what does not have meaning. It leads to our second point. We must, psychoanalysts, abandon the fantasy that we would turn into something we are not, that bewitched by the image and sounds, we would lose our position like psychoanalysts. This is perhaps one of the fantasies that frighten psychoanalysts the most. In this fearful imaginary, we would be like Ulysses sailors who, seduced by the mermaid chant, were led to extinction. Following Hollenbach's metaphor describing psychoanalysis' contribution to culture, as a singular form of listening, the listening of the significant. Psychoanalysis cannot cover their ears with wax or to tie themselves to the mast of the ship, be it mast of theory or the mast of technique. We are forced to run the risk of getting lost in this listening. This is what rejuvenates us and what makes it possibility to listen to psychotics, suicidal, and neurotics, however they are described in a given society. It is all about caring for the other suffering, where the suffering, these symptoms, would not be read as a disease at the beginning. What matters in the course of an analysis is for each person to be able to say his own name and not the one imputed the label, or at least to claim what they have inherited at the young and do something with, something with it. The film Cabra Marcado para Morrer, A Man Signed to Die, in its recounting of various times and testimonies, show this capacity of cinema to grant the war to people who have suffered a tragedy of their time and how they deal with it. A precious moment is speaking and giving voice, granting the words. This condition permeates 7 de outubro and continuous films as well. And now I come to the third point introduced with elegance by our guests. And what dialogues with other fields and disciplines does continuous cinema entail or invite? This concerns the dialogue or I say the influence of cinematography discourse on psychoanalysis, more specifically on the formation of the psychoanalysts. In other words, in the current state of our praxis, paraphrasing Carlos Drummond de Andrade, quoted by Coutinho in the film of Carlos, the psychoanalyst must be a cultivated subject, not a scholar as conventionally understood or that one who takes interest in culture as a dilettante. The recognition of a discursive form such as cinema, and more specifically, the particular kind of cinema in which Eduardo Coutinho is one of the masters, allows us to improve our practice, to give it continuity. 
it allows access, it gives visibility to this form or granting the word given voice to the other. Not as a benevolent conception, but as the fruit of a joint labor. Interviewer and interviewee are involved together in this relation of transference. Coutinho refers to it, uh, we, we see, we saw uh, the end and the beginnings. At the end of the film, once more, Mariquinha, who had never seen the image of herself smoking a pipe, declares her availability for love. He, she says, if I met someone, I get laid. <laughs> Coutinho even remember that João Salles, né, he shows now, notice their proximity in the detail of the image, the director glasses close to the face of the character. And like psychoanalysts, we added, she talks to him and not to her, no one else. We can bright light another example when Coutinho adds, I try to put myself into brackets to listen to the other. I need to be empty to make room for the word of the other. The scene of the man singing My Way in Edificio Master was of one of Coutinho's insistence on which uh, we have a document in another film uh, that named uh, Coutinho Dot Doc, Apartment 608, uh, directed by Bet Formagini. In this film, we watch how anguish and uncertainty are part of how decisions are made involve this scene and the other scenes. Here, another trace of the director's styles and his choices, and how they take shape. He finds a singular way to work in which he is pushed, forced to do it in this way and not in another. As Coutinho clarifies, this involves a constant invention in the work. Invention from the interviewee's side. Otherwise, he said, there's no film. Here, there is a particular form of relation to the other as an equal and to the other from the world and to the language. This relationship is symptomatic but not pathological, primarily concerned with how the subject manages his possibilities and limitations. Both are reflect in fiction and the unconscious as well as fiction are structured by language. Once more, let us refer to Carlos Nader's film when Coutinho recalls that if it weren't for language, there would be love or hate or friendship. Similarly, there would be no space for relations of family and inheritance. In various moments of the film, document or interview, like Carlos said, these dialogues arise. The characters ponder their relations as father and their parental function. Needless to say, that man assigning to die structures itself around the murder of that family's father. Now we can reaffirm the connection between tradition, memory and invention. As Coutinho himself states, without invention there is no film. It is in the fictionalization of the memory of the parental function and in the unfolding of each subject actions that we find the solution for each one. In Coutinho's films, this miracle is brought about through the articulation of technology with people. He says, I need a camera and a person who I don't know. Another way to talk about his process of experience and transmission is conveyed by the image that I, 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 I think it's a very beautiful image of an empty chair that appears at the beginning and at the end of the film of Carlos. At the beginning, the chair will be occupied by Coutinho, who will lead us to hear the voice of the upcoming scenes. At the end, the empty chair, the empty stage, to me resound like an invitation to our responsibility with his heritage. Images, words and sounds are rich are full of paradox. The camera enables the register and the body and the voice of director is placed in service of this desire and insistence that failures are incorporated into the work. Because 
it acknowledges that there is something possible to transmit. That is why one insists, one persists, as the poet said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hobson. Um, we also have a small change now. Uh, João Biu first, and then Tom Levine. João. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here and to listen to this uh, terrific, very moving and powerful presentations. The precarity of our lives is not merely happy or sad happenstance. It is part and parcel of small and large scale constellations and historical shifts that color our every experience. Desire follows these world historical trajectories and is always in an assemblage with other people and things. The ethnographer, like Ochino, at least at the end, sustains a belief in this world in flux. I am fascinated by what is unfinished, as he said in Carlos' powerful film or document, and both ethnographer and filmmaker acknowledge an inexhaustible richness and mystery at the core of the people we learn from when we let the knowledge of the other mark us. The necessity to be heard is one of the strongest of the human needs. Cochino's probing curiosity captures elements of this ongoing agonistic and inventive conversation between the plasticity of life and the plasticity of death. I say agonistic because people struggle to manage time and meaning amidst intolerable constraints or in the face of impossible choices. I mean inventive in the sense of desiring and trying to make or say things otherwise. As an anthropologist, I feel at home in Cochino's films. I identify with his efforts to capture real characters and their stories of becoming. His method, as a rule, was based on human contact, as we heard from, uh, from Carlos and also from João, enabled by contingency and a disciplined listening that gave both the filmmaker and his characters something to look for. Coutinho continuously challenges to listen to people, their self-understandings, their storytelling, their concept work, like the old man's palavras sem futuro, words without future, producing knowledge with people rather than of them, with deliberate openness to life in all its refractions. And he inspires us to try. The tentativeness is key here, as Robson said, to account for people's arts of existence and craft them into alternative figures of thought that might challenge present day regimes of truth and animate an anthropology and a broader humanities to come. Nothing is a given, all is a mystery, Everything is to be discovered, Cochino states, as if a poet in Sechi to Tubru. We are, after all, always in the middle way, as T.S. Eliot puts it, trying to learn to use words, painfully aware that every attempt is a wholly new start and a different kind of failure. And so, writes Eliot, each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate. I love the way Carlos Nader asked Cochino to randomly select from his own cast of characters. What a worldly archive uh, to people, their dialogue. Ultimately, it is our subjects, be they those of ethnography or of documentary, who allows us to return to the places where methods of narration and thoughts are born. In our returns to the transcripts and footage of random encounters, that shaped us and the representation or knowledge of the human conditions that we produced, we can learn from our experiences anew, entertain what could have been, and also live these encounters differently. As Coutinho puts it, o passado contado é mais intenso que o vivido. The past retold is more intense than the past lived. Keenly aware of the truth of filmmaking, like the most piercing and enduring of ethnographic works, Coutinho's camera seeks out speaking bodies. It is not the image, but the body 
that speaks, he says. And the body, as Marcel Mose reminded us, is man's first and most natural instrument. The techniques of the body are not the manifestation of a soul, as it were, but the embodied work of collective and individual practical reasons. That is, the social, the psychological, and the biological are knotted together in the ways in which the body acts. In the same vein, one could say that it's not an original biological design, nature's machine, that confers upon people the elements of what makes for a life history. Through and beyond any productive and reproductive lives, bodies also need to create stories from their entangled existence. Life stories are the ultimate platform for a recognizable human experience. And the utmost brilliance and inventiveness, in my view, of uh, Coutinho's films lies precisely in the ways he operates in reality, carving out a dialogical and intersensorial space for this wondrous work of human fabulation, which surpasses the real fictional polarity, and it's actually captured on camera. Qu quotations from him, this miracle of people saying what they say does not happen without the camera. I must be empty for the person to tell me. A co-presence ensues. The film puts us together in the image. The filmmaker and his characters become others together and one through the other. I know it was a happy moment, he says. One could think of this erotically charged filmic encounter, as Eduardo reminded us, and as Coutinho deemed it himself in the film Sete de Outubro, as a plateau in Gregory Bateson's and later Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari's sense, that is, a continuous, self-vibrating region of intensities whose development avoids any orientation toward a culmination point or external end. The plateau is about people's plasticity. It is a kind of intersubjective medium, a bizarre intensive stabilization for finding footholds on a register other than unbearable routines and the flux of social life. Cochino sought locations and characters who might otherwise remain forgotten and invented plateaus in which someone else might listen to them and think with and through their historic travails, people learning to live, living on, believing in, and resisting death, and their sense of what is most important to a human being. In Cochino's work, we are reminding, reminded that the artist's greatest gift is to insist on the uniqueness of each one of us, fated to walk the earth as a particular place and time, at times alone, at times carving out a home or a story with another irreplaceable being, and to register the human struggle and inexorable loss in the face of time that Shakespeare so beautifully captured when he said to a youth in his 15th sonnet, and all in war with time for love of you. As time takes from you, I engraft you new. Life stories, as those apprehended by Coutinho, do not simply begin and end. They are stories of transformation. They link the present to the past and to a possible future and create ties between the characters, filmmakers, and spectators like us who can project them onwards, helping to shape their afterlives. Today, we continue to celebrate unique ways Eduardo Coutinho engaged people and how he allowed bodily storytellings to infuse his own creative work. We are forever grateful for his inventive dialogical plateau that's now on the screens. Keeping interrelatedness, precarity, uncertainty, and curiosity in focus, Cochino's films keep expanding the limits of reasoning and imagination, and one would hope uh, marking the possibility of a people that's yet to come, including ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, João. Now, Tom, Tom Levine. Well, um, 
I'm, uh, I see my job here both as uh, a segue to what I hope will be a, a, a lively discussion both with you and the participants. Um, my institutional hat um, is as a media theorist, and so uh, I, I want to take on a work that in many ways is incompatible with almost everything that we've been talking about today. Let me try to explain why. I want to talk about a film, Cuccino's penultimate film, Un, Un Gia Navida to, from 2010, which, for those of you who don't know it, is a rather astonishing 90-plus uh, minute documentation, uh, compilation, distillation of 19 hours of watching of public television. Public in the sense of open channels, not cable. It's a, what film, if we want to invoke a film genre, uh, what film historians and theorists call the film de montage, or a compilation film. It's made entirely of pieces of television. Evangelical preachers, commercials, plastic surgeons, more commercials, news broadcasts, no soccer, no mm -hmm. soccer. Uh, and, and Cuccino in an interview explains that one of the criterion for choosing the day on which he would do this 19 hours of consecutive viewing was that it would not be a weekend day and it would not be a day with a huge important match, uh, etc. Nothing remarkable happened on this day. It was just a televisual quotidian landscape. 90 plus minutes without any voiceover without any commentary of any sort, almost no credits. It would be interesting if we had time to compare it to the, one of the, final, the, the final film by Guy Debord, Guy Debord, Son Art et Son Temps, which is also a compilation of, of television material, but of a very different sort. So another interesting historical fact, made in 2010, this film, Gia Navida, was shown at festivals, but shown at festivals only under the condition that Cuccino be there, and that the entrance was free due to copyright issues. It was a film that was radically unavailable until somebody uploaded it to YouTube, mm -hmm. and now it is radically available. Um, I urge you tonight to go and watch this film. <laughs> it's super interesting and challenging in ways that I hope to uh, suggest for our conversation today. Um, <clears throat> I decided to talk about this film as opposed to any of the others, remarkable, as we've gotten only a small sense of through Carlos Nader's marvelous documentary and the, the, the delicious and moving examples that we've been treated to in the other presentations, because it's such a radical exception, utterly unlike, as far as I know, and I'm not a Cuccino scholar, but from what I know of Cuccino's oeuvre, utterly unlike anything else he did. Maybe, maybe it's like, something else, other things he did. And that might be actually an interesting question. But on the surface, formally, it seems very different. Um, if, as we've heard from Cuccino in the interview uh, himself and in the commentaries of others, his work is about seeing and listening, about waiting, about patience, about the fragile I-thou filmmaker-subject relation, about speech, gesture, and gaze, as Escarell put it, there's Nothing of that in this film. Or, or is there? If, as Cuccino said in Carlos Nader's documentary, his work is all about the dialogic, about the voice, about speaking bodies, then what are we to make of a film whose subject is incapable of dialogue and has neither voice nor body? Yes, there are lots of bodies in, in Gia Navida, uh, and you could say it's about, a televi it's about televisual bodies, about bodies on TV. They're hugely refashionable. There's a lot of discussion of boom booms and, 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 uh, and, and the incredible malleability of the corporeal. Um, but it's also about the body of media. And I don't think it's by accident that the vast majority of the images in this film are themselves, you could say, second order images, medial artifacts, complex medial artifacts, a catalog of televisual 
technological artisanality, weird screens within screens, strange lo-fi tech devices, animations, people talking with a parrot, but the parrot is a, some kind of a mechanical parrot, and uh, air, air guitars, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. If Cucina's films are at some important level about place, what kind of place is a montage of televisual clips? If Cucino's films are about an eros, an erotic dynamic between him and his subjects, what to make of this claim when the object is a medial object, a televisual object? What's the eros of watching, of editing a broadcast flow? And there may well be one. Can there even be an eros when, by definition, it lacks that constitutive co-presence? Cucino's method, we see, is marked by a waiting incredible patience by, in formal terms, a long, the long take, the centrality of the long take. Think of the camera that keeps filming when people stop speaking, a camera that keeps filming when people leave the stage, leave the image and go behind the curtain. By a sensitivity, an incredible sensitivity. But all this is structurally precluded when the object is a televisual montage. Yes, there are longer takes in this film, in the sense that we get five-minute-long sequences of evangelical preaching, of intolerable, an inter, intolerable interview with a plastic surgeon. Uh, but even these long, uh, extended, uh, uh, staying with a program are full of cuts. Right? So there's no, none of this uh, durational force uh, that we've, we learned in the discussion about silence, for example, and its force and its power. TV is never silent. Most of the critical response, or it's silent only when it fails, um, which is interesting. Most of the critical response to um, Gia Navida describes it uh, as a kind of catalog of the vulgarity and trash of, of, of the televisual landscape, the poverty uh, even if, as one critic argues, the televisual transported to the cinema is somehow transformed, right? This a kind of cinematic redemption of televisual detritus, right? Obviously, watching television in a cinema uh, is a fundamentally different thing. Of course, that argument becomes equally problematic or interestingly varied when we're now watching it thanks to YouTube on small screens at home. But given Cuccino's ben deeply Benjaminian sensibility, as we've heard on a num number of occasions today, don't we need to attend to his attention to medial trash very carefully, given the remarkably central importance of the figure of trash for Benjamin? Yes, Umgio Navida is a truly macabre montage of violence, manipulation, vulgarity, etc. The landscape it catalogs is very much like that of Sky Mall, rest in peace. That amazingly, air, that amazing airline publication, <laughs> recently stopped uh, 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 publication, unfortunately, but which was always a great joy whenever I got on airplanes, um, which set the standard for what one can only call, and this is a word I learned from Pedro in one of the first times we met on an, of course, where else, airplane, um, what one could only call Jeringonza aesthetics. <laughs> Truly useless things that will transform your life forever. Consumption as redemption. And yet, just as we've come to recognize the enormous importance of contingency in Cuccino's work, we need to take the time to attend to, to reflect on the specificity of Cuccino's contingency when channel surfing, which was effectively, the, if I understand the, the literature correctly, uh, the film's mode of production. They had eight or nine uh, channels going spontaneous, uh, simultaneously, and he would basically say, take that, and they would basically cut to that uh, feed, and, and it was basically, in other words, a kind of performance, a real-time record of his channel surfing, of his attentiveness to the television. When does, he, when does Cuccino tarry? in front of the televisual, to what sort of image, and for how long, etc. What would it mean to watch television with a sensibility like Cuccino's? 
It certainly is not to dismiss the televisual as hopelessly mass cultural. I, I think his militant insistence on the importance of vulgarity, of the quotidian, of the contingent, uh, et cetera, et cetera, makes that very clear, and which makes the, the largely uniform response to this film as you know, completely, desperately vulgar, that is, the landscape it catalogs, remarkable in that it doesn't want to take seriously that this is Cuccino's take on that landscape. What would that mean? Um, rather, it's to ask, I want to suggest, what the powerful example of Cuccino's documentary practice means for the study, the reflection on, the theorization of mass culture. Among the many things that Cuccino's oeuvre has taught us, and continues to teach us, Ungia Navida reminds us that Cuccino also challenged us to think about how to think about, how to watch, how to listen to and see mass culture. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I would like to, to make a question for João Moreira Salles about the, the shoot you show us. It was so incredible to see this new footage and something that's going to happen in the future, talking about what Coutinho has done, but it's not, it's yet unfinished, and you are working on it. But to me, it was kind of uh, impre uh, impressed me, the way Coutinho was different in that scene, talking with this teenager. It seemed to me that he was not the same Coutinho that used to talk with uh, Dona Maricotinha or something like many other per uh, personages he had, <laughs> okay, characters. And, and I, I noticed that the woman that talks with him when he is t talking about the, the impression he, he had that it's a failure, that project, he's not going to, to places he wanted to go. He talked, he, uh, the, the girl asked him, but you are there, you were there when you were talking with those people? If I was there? No, no, <laughs> the girl asked Coutinho, but so what's, what's the problem? The problem maybe it's you were there with them and he says, ah, I don't know, maybe not. And at the end when he's talking to that teenager, he's not quite listening to him. <laughs> that was my impression because he keeps almost n uh, in a nervous way talking with him and interrupting the teenager. I don't know, I would like to know your impressions about that because that was my impression and I was so strongly touched by that scene, so. Thank you. I would suggest since we, we don't have that much time that we take one or two more questions as condensed as possible since. Um, I have a question. Yeah, Eliana, uh, just a mic. Thank you, Mom. My question is um, to the anthropologist and to the filmmakers. Since Robinson, I am a psychoanalyst, and he talked about psychoanalysis and what we do. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, I know the anthropologists, when you work with your uh, people you interview, you go back there and you talk with people after a year, two years, I don't know. We, when we work, we open some investigation and we keep working with our patients. What happens in documentaries? What happened, Co Cochino never go, went back to talk with people. He opened some stories. What happened with those people? That's a question. Thank you. Perhaps, perhaps one more, more question, if, if there is. Someone else? OK, so we can. Well, uh, answering your question, I, I really believe it's just the opposite. I like this scene very much because I think that it shows that Cochin, although he thought 
at the beginning of the film that the whole project was doomed to fail. And he really thought that. I mean, Cochino had a kind of an exorcism thing that in any film he would think that it was a failure. And he would say it is a failure. The same way he would say that a plane he was ready to board would crash because it was a way of not crashing the plane. <laughs> but at this time, with this film, he really thought he was going uh, to fail because he was not well physically, mentally, uh, because he was dealing with a new set of characters uh, which were not his basic characters. I mean, very young people, as I said. And as I saw the rushes after he died, I discovered that he was wrong. I mean, there was, first of all, a lot of happiness in the fact that he was shooting <coughs> and he was there uh, alive, which was very different from Cochino when he left the studio and, and came to me, I, I'm, I'm the producer of the film, uh, to say that he was, I mean, failing miserably. And when I saw the rushes, I could see that the basic happiness of being there with the characters, engaging them in a the dialogue, was was there. And with this, with this Thiago, with with this with this kid, I think that what strikes me as very beautiful is that he engages the boy. I mean, he doesn't treat the boy as a as as a boy, and and there's a lot of banality but he doesn't treat it as banal. So when the, when the boy says, uh, is there life after death or something like that, it is a serious question and he, and, he, and he answers as a serious person talking to a serious person. And something new happens to Cochino and to the boy, I think. There's a kind of illumination about, I mean, silence and and eternal silence and 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 the mystery of life and it is a grown up conversation <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't condescend which i think is basic for any conversation and 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 I, and that's why the fact that he cuts the boy and he says you're wrong it's not life, life. or love it's life and love this is how you speak to a to a person i mean if you really want to speak you speak the way it is you don't try to you don't try to to make it easy because it's not easy and the boy understands that and 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 suddenly coaching is talking about things that are very personal to him about his death the fact that he's on the brink of death he's very ill about the problem of eternal silence and 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 so he's talking about himself and that's why it's a real conversation and uh, that's one of the main things about Cochino he he never condescends and I think that Tom is absolutely right in saying that when he decided to make the film he made it because he took television very seriously uh, mass culture was very important for Coutinho and uh, criticism of this film was very poor because he was right people were saying well it's just a compilation of trash and this is Coutinho making it making it clear how trashy television is in opposition to the to the to the the, the authority of film and 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 Cochin was furious about that because it's just the opposite. So I think that he engages television the same way that he engages this boy and he engages every, 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 everything that he engages with, taking it seriously. And that's why I think that the conversation is very beautiful. It becomes a real conversation. And that's why I say that although he felt that he was failing with that conversation, I know that he knew that he was doing his cinema. He was, he was really bringing something new to himself and to the boy, and some illumination was there in place, and and that's why I think it's really beautiful.
Well, about going back, um, I don't think uh, we can speak in, in general terms about filmmakers. There can be different kinds of experiences. Uh, but in, in Coutinho's case, at least, uh, there was one uh, great exception that I, I mentioned. Yeah. Um, when he made, in 1984, a film he took 20 years to make. <laughs> it started in 1964, and he fin only could only finish it 20 years later. Uh, he established a certain relationship with uh, the widow of Jean-Pierre Teixeira, which was a, a peasant that was uh, killed in 1962. And he, throughout a certain period, he maintained a cer certain kind of, not, not very close, but he, he did not go back until uh, shortly, I think a year before his death, uh, he went there because there was going to be released the DVD of this film, which had never been released. And it was kind of obvious, I mean, a film of the importance of Cabra Marcado para Morrer, that he should include new interviews with her and with some of her sons that were in the film. But he hated to go back. He went because it was kind of a, at least, that's what he showed. I mean, uh, he did not want to go back. And, and if, if you see the images that are in the DVD, it, it's always kind of contradictory in Cochino. I mean, he said he hated it, but when he was there, he seemed to, to like it also. And, but it, it's, it, it's one of the very rare cases in which he went back. And there are other exceptions also. One, we saw one of them when one of the characters in uh, Jogo de Sena, she asks to come back. Because Coutinho always had this, he had, he, I, I, I don't know if, I think Jean would not agree, maybe, but he was very dogmatic uh, with certain ideas. But he was, at the same time, capable of being open. A, a character asking to come back is something, something absolutely surprising and unexpected. But he was capable, capable of accepting that and including, the, he, he could have accepted, shot her, and not included in the film. Yeah. But he included in the film, it's the last sequence of the film also. Uh, the, 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 we spoke of the physical nearness of the film, uh, of him with, with the characters. In, in, I don't know if all of you maybe have not seen the Edificio Master, but there, it, one of the characters does not look at him. Well, that's absolutely uh, con contradictory with all his principles that are, as was mentioned here today, based on the fact of being near, looking in the eyes. And he chose her, he knew she did, because w when the assistant shot, he, he mentioned this. Ah, you, you didn't look when you made the first interview. And she, but he, there, there's also, if you see the scene again, there's a table between them which is something that is unthinkable in, in his film, that he is sitting, there's a table, and then the girl, that, that, that she starts not looking at him at all. So in Coutinho's case, he says in, in, in Carlos Nader's films that he hates people and loves characters. Well, it's, it's, it's not... Not hundred percent truth. I mean, true. I believe. I mean, he, 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 he as Jean said, as Jean mentioned, had this kind of capacity to treat people on their own terms. Uh, it's a, a respectful, very respectful way of speaking to people. A boy or a any person that he would that he would meet and with whom he would talk. But I, I would say maybe 
my mistake, I don't know if it's wrong, is that generally a filmmaker does not go back. I mean, yeah. uh, there are some cases, uh, th I think th there are the, the exceptions. I mean, you, it's uh, a documentary is kind of like someone who arrives from Mars, shoots and goes back to the planet and does not keep, maintain a certain re personal relationship because it, 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 it's impossible. I mean, it's practically impossible. I mean, and, and, and sometimes it doesn't work very well, as Cochino, I think, knew. I would just like to add something. I think it has also to do with the idea that uh, Cochino expresses repeatedly that he liked unfinished things. The idea of going back or to tell the story of what happened is, uh, is, to, is to believe in closure, you know? He hated closure because there's no closure in life. I know it's an American myth, closure. <laughs> But closure does not exist. <laughs> so uh, it's very typical in documentaries, especially in this country, when you shoot people. At the end, you say, um, uh, such and such person is now doing that, such and such is doing that, and he was able to get into Princeton. Uh, he was able to, now he's living in Hawaii. As if this <laughs> was a full stop in the story of this person. Now everything is, is rounded up and, and you have a bow tie. That doesn't exist. So I think that Cochin would not go back also because he wouldn't like to know what happened because uh, if he knew what happened, it was just another stage of something, of a story that is still unfinished. There's no, f there's no ending. So they leave it up to you to uh, imagine the rest or live with the anguish of not knowing the rest which he would actually prefer. <laughs> Just one more thing. I mean, I think it's important to, to mention that Cabra Marcado para Morrer is a film of going back. Yeah. He shot in 1964, and he went back 17 years in 81 to finish the film. So he, I think he kind of exhausted <laughs> with Cabra Marcado para He had the experience of going back. And he wanted to make films different from Cabra Marcado para Morrer, which is one of his anguishes after having made the film. So, but it, well, I just want to don't don't forget that. <laughs> I think we have a, a, a few very brief minutes, whatever a brief minute means. Uh, um, Arcadio, you had a question. Um, just a mic or phone, because we are shooting. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. This was uh, fascinating to me. I learned a great deal, and uh, we don't have too much time, so I'll just um, ask one question. I have many, but uh, emptiness. Uh, I was struck by that, uh, thinking of narration and uh, what a narration means, dialogue, and the idea. And the question is, um, uh, perhaps for you, Jobil, as an anthropologist, but it has to do with the psychoanalysis and uh, the idea of um, uh, emptiness and emptying oneself in order to engage the other in dialogue and to receive something. Is that the ethnographer too or is that uh, a very sophisticated theory of narration as well? And because it, strikes me, it struck me that uh, he's, not, uh, he's so unhappy with what he calls routine and routine uh, would be like theater because you have to repeat and you have to, by definition, it's routine. You have to go back all the time. Whereas this ideal dialogue uh, occurs just one time, uh, and, but the condition for that dialogue is that you have to empty. One of the two is empty and receives from the other uh, with no routine, like in the theater. Uh, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, it reminded me in a way, but quite different too, from Goffman, the presentation of self, because the self is, uh, doesn't exist really. I mean, you just uh, act all the time, and, and it's like a peg where you have your, uh, your part, right? Uh, 
But in Goffman, the theater is uh, important for social life. Uh, and here, um, it goes against the idea. He wanted to go ideally, at least in, in those statements that he made against uh, routine. Could you comment on that? And can comment uh, from the perspective of, of someone who, who who loves his films, who, who who watch some of the films, and who can make free associations. You know, so I don't pretend to be a, 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 an, a, an expert on this. And going back to Eliana's question, uh, I think there are various ways of returning. I would add just what what João and Eduardo said, and I think what Carlos did in his film is a return. He returns. There's an archive there of mm -hmm. sorts. So, 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 and, there, and that happens in anthropology too. If you look at Levi Strauss, right? He he wrote Tristram Peaks. How many years after, right? So he, time had to pass for him to return, to regain a, a relationship to that experience and to write it down. So, so, so I think there are many ways of returning. I am the kind of anthropologist who loves to return to the field, literally, because I love to get a sense of the work of time. What happens in the meantime? What has changed and what has not? So that's really a crucial question, right? The, the intractability of things. So, 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 so I think there's a variety of returns. And, and, I, and I think the, uh, the point that I, that I tried to, to make and that connects with, uh, with Arcade and that you know, João made so powerful in his presentation is that moment of the dialogue, the erotic dialogue, you know, that bodily dialogue. There's something there of the work of fabulation and in some ways, I think people are bringing the world into that encounter. And they are returning to the world with, with, with a sense of this storytelling. And I think that's what's so powerfully captured in the camera, and that's so unique. So I don't know, you know, we probably, you guys can talk about this. There's comparative ways to think of other documentary filmmakers who work on that register, but it's really doing something, created an instance of a human capacity, a human need mm -hmm. to tell stories, storytelling. So it's not so much looking for, are they really telling the truth of what's happening? And if I return, would I testify to that? No, something was unleashed, you know? So there might be a return differently of the character back, you know, to the ordinary. Right, mm -hmm. which 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 which, uh, which can be unbearable, but the storytelling is a way of, you know, of, of engaging with this mm -hmm. unbearable. Yeah. You know, it's not an, an an excision, a retrieval from the world. I think it's bringing the world and remaking it through that storytelling. Yeah. We, um, yeah. In order to be uh, precisely fifteen minutes late, yeah. we we still have two minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Once in a time, I was a journalist and have one minute <laughs> to, to talk at the radio. So <laughs> I, I, I found very interesting uh, that John Bill says about there is various ways to return. But um, I think to that uh, the point is um, we, we have to recognize there is an impossibility to be completely empty. Mm -hmm. We do our best. <laughs> to do this. <laughs> and that's why we analyze ourselves, <laughs> that we try uh, to do, uh, um, and to follow the recommendation of Fry uh, in, in the beginning of the 19th century or the 20th century. <laughs> uh, each interview is new. Even if the people, uh, the person return after 10 years, but each time is a new time. It's impossible to return our uh, the time it was. That's our uh, reconnection. That's impossibility. I think that the, the key is you try to be empty, to be open, uh, to be wide, but I think it's uh, including an ethical position. You try recognizing this impossibility. I think this. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much, uh, Hobson. Um, thank you so much. We have a 15-minute break, and there is coffee and some cookies, hopefully, outside. And then uh, in within 15 minutes, we'll be back. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>